Uh, hello, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this talk. Uh, so just to give an introduction of what this is going to be, uh, this is largely based on a study that we did with a serving uh, IPS officer somewhere around 21, 20, 2020-21. Um, so this is done by our think tank DeepStrat. Um, it's largely to figure out what is the state of industry with respect to fintech fraud and how it evolves and uh, what can we do about it, etc. The co-author of this, uh, Mr. Chandra Mohan, couldn't make it today. So I'm going to cover some part of it for him. Uh, so let's go ahead with it. Yeah. What is this talk about? Uh, this is about, uh, we're going to learn quite a bit about the high-level architecture of fintech frauds. And uh, the second part about is about what do you think from the point of view of fraudster and how do you, how do you basically, they think about the art of human vulnerability exploitation. Uh, the third part, I'm going to talk about how to run a bootstrap uh, fraud enterprise and scale it up. Uh, the last part is going to be about uh, how to fight uh, fraud at scale. So this is largely how uh, the structure of the talk is going to be. Yeah. Uh, w so, what is the high-level architecture of fintech frauds? Now, if you understand this picture, uh, this is basically Gubber Singh saying that uh, I have multiple personalities and I need a lot and lot of IDs. Yeah. So, at the heart of every fintech fraud uh, is always ID fraud. There is really no fintech fraud without an ID fraud. I mean, that is something as a high-level architecture you need to understand. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at it from a pure technology point of view, uh, so this one you are probably largely familiar with because this is how the certificate uh, management system of the HTTPS certificate works. So you have a bunch of root identities, they basically certify intermediate identities and then uh, you have a whole bunch of human identities on the other end. Yeah, And this is how largely uh, DSE providers, digital sign providers work. They basically think of technology as a linear view. Uh, but this is not how actually fraudsters look at it. Uh, they think of it as a circular pattern. Yeah. So if you look at the bottom one, they basically create a bunch of root IDs, then create a whole bunch of intermediary IDs, then create human IDs, and then recycle it back into the root IDs. So uh, if you think of fraud as a linear enterprise, you would never really truly understand how these guys work. Uh, they basically think in terms of graphs, Topologies, circles, never like linear trees. So, so that is something fundamentally you need to think in terms of understanding the architecture of how fraud works. Yeah. Uh, so the next problem that you see about human identity is it's a pretty hard problem uh, because of this unvariable uh, indicator called time. Because if you really understand how human identities work for fraudsters, no matter what kind of fraud they are engaged in, uh, they invest on human identities. They have a very long-term view about human identities. It is not a short-term view. So what happens is you create a fake identity or you take over your identity, you invest a lot of time and energy to build it up. And over a longer period of time, say three years or five years or ten years, that human identity becomes a very valuable commodity. And uh, then it becomes a trusted identity. And then you use a trusted identity to create, uh, certify other identities and so on and so on. So the fundamental nature of human identity is that as a fraudster operating on it, if you can hit assumptions on what the human identity is based on, uh, then you're free. So this is like a statement that you normally see on log analysis saying that if you can escape uh, detection of logs, then you're free. So here they operate on the same principles. They say that if you hit assumptions on human identity, then you're basically free. So that is one of the reasons why you, do, you do really understand that uh, human identity is a very hard problem to solve. It is not pretty easy at all. Yeah. And uh, so if you write down and think about the human identity assumptions that people typically make, uh, so these are the common assumptions that you would make as a technologist. You would come back and say, no two, no two humans ever have the same biometrics, and it would the next assumption that underlies most of it is uh, database on human identities are reasonably accurate. Uh, the third assumption that you typically make is humans will not change their body parts. Uh, and uh, the fourth assumption is kind of implicit. Uh, you make an assumption that human body parts will not change on their own. So these are the four assumptions that typically have on any human identity. 
fraudsters typically understand this much well and hence they work towards breaking those assumptions. And uh, so this is last week's case. So if you look at uh, what is basically said is uh, there is basically a fingerprint changing operator. You can go and get your fingerprints changed by doing a surgery. And uh, this was busted out last week. So what they basically do is uh, you have a you have an entire supply chain of people who can change your fingerprints. Uh, it needs an operation. It needs a stitch. You need to let it heal for like three months, six months, and the next identity is usable for about one one and a half years. Uh, so if you look at what this was uh, very interesting is if you were in a ban list of fingerprints uh, because you are deported or you are basically marked as A B C D as a scammer. Uh, this is one way in which you evade the whole problem. You can create a new identity out of just changing the fingerprints. Uh, this was last week. Um, so this is one one uh, example of where it doesn't work at all. Yeah. So the next thing is this uh, scalable biometric generation. This happened about one and a half weeks ago. Uh, this is another example of uh, how they think about changing biometrics. So in this example, what they did is uh, when you go for an update. They would just change your picture with the picture of the scammer, and uh, once you do that, uh, it's pretty easy for you to get loans uh, because if you look at most of the uh, loan providers, what they typically do is they do an OTP, they do a facial recognition kind of a thing, which compares what you see on the video KYC is the same thing as what uh, you see on the identity document, and in this case, by changing it on the supply chain, they effectively replace your identity uh, with something else. Uh, they don't change your fingerprints. They don't change your iris scan. They just change your photographs. Yeah. Uh, so this is a very common form of uh, breakdown. And if you look at uh, how bad it is, uh, so this is how bad it is. So uh, you can just see that uh, they obtain fingerprints of an authorized agent, and then uh, the cost of this is just silicon uh, gel and uh, uh, some part of uh, you know an iris photograph, a high resolution image of an iris photograph. So quite a lot of this is commercially viable, and it actually happens at scale, except that people don't know about it. The only time you know about it is uh, is, is the famous case of Sunny Leon, where she applied for a home loan, and then uh, people she was denied the home loan because there were like three twenty five thousand rupee uh, loans that were pending on her. So I, I had investigated that case. Uh, it's pretty interesting how they had actually looked at it. Uh, they precisely figured out which vulnerabilities exist in what part of the supply chain. Figure out how to create forged identity documents and uh, take loan on her names. Uh, so it's a pretty sophisticated scam. So just think about uh, when you think about fraud, always think about the first level of identity fraud. It always starts with an identity fraud. It doesn't actually happen without it. Yeah. Uh, so just a quick question: uh, How many of you guys have heard about the India stack? Just put your hands up. The India stack. Okay. That's a that's a surprise. I usually expected a lot more hands. Anyway, have you heard about the uh, fraud stack? Yeah. Okay. So this is how it looks, right? Uh, so I'll go about explaining some of the components in it, and there are some interesting additions here. Uh, so you you have to basically distribute the work into core layer and operational layer, and what you see in media reports and what you see when it actually happens uh, is is the operational layer. There the TTPs change all the time. Uh, but at the bottom layer, you see there is a core layer, and this is where they usually operate. Uh, in the core layer, you have identity, telecom, and banking. And uh, if you really understand why this is core layer, because this is where all the money gets routed, uh, and identities are created at well. I'll give a very small example. Uh, how many of you guys have ever received some kind of SMS says, uh, "If you do not do A, B, C, D, your bank account will be frozen." Oh, that's a lot of people. Yeah, <laughs> I expected it. Yeah. Uh, so at the heart of this, uh, you have to ask a very interesting question. Let's say you are one of those people who got fooled into sharing your OTP and your bank account get lost. What do you think is the chance of recovery of that money? Any violent guesses? No. Very low. Yeah. In, in fact, it's 0.5 um, percent. And uh, the reason why is it so is because how the money gets routed. Uh, so I will give another example towards the very end. So what they do is they, as soon as the money hits their bank account, whatever the number is, it just split into multiple small pieces and instantly and automatically routed towards 
a whole bunch of bank accounts that is all over the country. So let us say you lost about 25,000 bucks. It would be split into 1,000 into 25 and be routed to many bank accounts, payment wallets and whatnot and whatnot. It's fully and totally automated, yeah? Uh, they even have uh, payment uh, APIs. I once seen a Razorpay API uh, which uses a split one. So uh, how many of you know about the split payment thing by any chance? Okay, right. So if you don't understand how split payment works, uh, think of like an e-com service provider. You bought something in Amazon which is 1,000 rupees. Amazon takes 20% commission. So they only keep 200, 800 rupees goes to the vendor. So as soon as the money comes, they basically put it on a nodal account, hold it, and then the money gets routed automatically with T plus one, T plus two settlements. Uh, they use exactly the same payment splitting thing that, uh, that FinTech uses. As soon as the money comes into one account, it's basically routed into multiple accounts automatically, and you can't trace the hell out of it. Yeah, believe me when I tell you that. It just instantly evaporates. I, we, I had seen a parliamentary MP losing 25 lakh rupees and uh, the bank basically paid him back because they knew they could not raise it back. So such incidents are pretty galore. So if you look at it, why the core layer is interesting is because in the core layer is when you need lots and lots of SIM cards and you need lots and lots of bank accounts. And so the way in which it works is that uh, you need to have a huge cache of pre-existing SIM cards and pre-created bank accounts on which you need control. There are two, three ways in which they do it. Uh, first is uh, hijacked identities. Uh, so in, in the case of hijacked identities, it's like Sunny Leon case where she didn't know anything, but they just hijacked her identity using uh, loopholes in other systems. Uh, the second thing, what we have seen is called mule accounts. So you would go to a person in Jharkhand and say, look, uh, I will give you 10% of the loot. You please give me your bank account passwords. I will manage it. So this is one way of actually operating it. The third thing is you may not even know that your identity was compromised and they opened uh, bank accounts on your name. This also happened in, in, in Sunny Leon's case. So existing people, uh, ghost accounts, active collusion. Uh, so all this happens on the core layer. Uh, so you could create ba SIM cards and whatnot and whatnot. And then uh, you would see many people complaining about WhatsApp accounts being used. It's a pretty popular one because you know what? Into an encryption. No one can trace it. Yeah. So this is on the uh, core layer. The operational layer is what I told you about. Uh, they're pretty sophisticated in using all the payment stacks with uh, popular uh, payment aggregators and they register themselves sometimes as businesses, sometimes as uh, individuals, sometimes as LLPs quite often. And uh, of course, they know how to do fraud KYC at scale. Uh, so you call it eKYC, they call it FKYC uh, with obvious, uh, you know, French around it. Uh, then, of course, use hacking tools. Uh, they're not pretty sophisticated hacking tools. Uh, most of the hacking tools is about, I'll send you a link, you click on it, I'll put a spyware on your phone. And people usually do it uh, for a variety of reasons. Team Viewer continues to be a very popular choice in spite of uh, many payment aggregators trying to uh, uh, do an Android uh, get applications and, uh, you know, they would just look at if Team Viewer installed, they would not operate. Uh, so that is one. The last bit is very interesting. Sharpshooters. I didn't think that uh, you would have uh, sharpshooters in your fraud stack, but this is a pretty new one. Uh, so you see, you see the operation layer. Most of the people see the operation layer, but they don't. You don't actually see the core layer, but it is pretty interlinked. Yeah. So this is the high-level architecture of most of the payment frauds. Uh, this thing applies both for individuals and for uh, organizations. So when you say organizations. They may probably create a non-existent shell company on your name, make you a director with your DSC, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, do import-export licenses on your name. So this exists. So you, so this is what when you see government uh, news which says that GST raids on shell companies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, this is the one. And then when you, when you see non-existent people and you see uh, so many new forged identities are found, this is the reason. I mean, you don't create a forged identity without a long-term purpose. The long-term purpose is to do this. Yeah. Uh, so next goes back to the art of human vulnerability exploitation. Uh, so this is a scammer's view. And uh, this is what you think of yourself. Uh, you think of yourself as the thinking man, but uh, this is what you are really, a linking man, right? How many of you guys get IT notices from your organization saying, do not click the damn link? Everyone, how many of you do click the links? <laughs> Right? Yeah? So this is really what you are, and they understand you much better than you yourself. Yeah? 
uh, and uh, how do they think about you? This is how they think about you. So they look at you, the human brain, and uh, you are familiar with this idea of about attack surfaces. And uh, every cybersecurity guy comes and tells you, reduce your attack surface, reduce your attack surface. This is your brain attack surface, as you see from this camera, right? Try defending against it. I can bet you would fail, right? So uh, if you look at the payment frauds, it's pretty sophisticated human exploitation. It is very low tech. You would not see some commercial high grade malware uh, or some hacking tools, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this is really what you are, yeah. And they understand this much better. And what is the space in which they operate? This is the space. Need to act fast. And this is the one emotion they know how to trigger very well. And uh, what are those two emotions that they know how to trigger very well? Uh, this is it. Feed and Greer. Nothing else. Only two scripts. In all our FAR analysis, there are only two scripts. There is really no other script uh, that works at scale much well. And this is fear and greed. Nothing more, nothing less. Yeah? And uh, script number one, this is what we call as a nasty bank official. I'm pretty sure you can relate to it. How many of you have met a nasty bank official when you interact with the bank? Yeah? The guy who threatens you, the guy who doesn't give you service, right? This is the guy. And uh, so when they call you and say that uh, your account is going to be suspended, you have not been KYC'd, uh, you have not had transactions, et cetera, et cetera, this is the script they use. Uh, the keywords are usually this. Government, not the type of Reserve Bank. <laughs> yeah? Uh, money gone and shut down. So if you basically do what we call as a... Uh, logistical regression analysis of the scripts they use. These are the four words that you would find often in different forms. Uh, it, it, the, uh, the emphasis on the call recordings are specific. Uh, it will always trigger meltdown and fear. So remember that, the need to act fast button. Uh, the intention, as you know, is share OTP and click a link. These are the only two things they always do. Uh, everything else is like a variation of this, but this is the one. Uh, the nasty bank official is again very targeted demographic. It works very well on old people. Can you explain why? Demographic is explains only one on old people. Explain why? Yeah, go ahead. Hello. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, maybe th because they haven't really kept up with technology and haven't really gotten used to getting communication through Correct. via, le let's say, SMS. Or yeah, and WhatsApp. old people are much more amenable towards uh, these four words, particularly the first word, government. Yeah, uh, and the authoritarian thing works very well. Uh, the script two is the friendly bank official. Uh, this is a younger demographic. 20 to 30, uh, it triggers excitement and feeling special, works, see I'm not, I'm not trying to be, uh, works very well uh, with a certain demographic, uh, particularly people who earn uh, a lot. And uh, so the keywords here is free, cashback, special, yeah? And this is what failed a parliamentary MP, so you can imagine the word special, what it means for a parliamentary MP, yeah? Uh, the, again, the intention is share OTP. The intention is click a link. I mean, this is the same modus operandi that you would see again and again. And uh, so at this point of time, you can come and ask how well do these scripts work? This is the data. So you see the first two one, OTP shared by victim, pay via link, KYC lapped. This is like really, really 90, 95% of the scam. You'd see down, this is all something that we found. Uh, you, on the FAR analysis, this is what it is. Uh, so you can think of the TeamViewer app is interesting because it's it was a very upcoming thing then, but it got stopped quite a bit. But the first three ones are pretty interesting. So this is this is how they are usually operate. The script one and script two is the first two, three. That's about it. Yeah. And uh, so now let's look back at this OTP sharing. How often were you told that uh, the population is digitally illiterate? And so they, if only the population is digitally literate, uh, scams wouldn't happen uh, quite often. But if you look at it, uh, OTP is like such a common thing in India. Uh, it is both used for sharing and for non-sharing. So people come and say, show me your OTP. Uh, like the blue dot guy comes and asks for it. 
uh, the Covin guys comes and asks for it, the Ola guys ask for it, Uber guys ask for it. And uh, so what you have is you now have a communication pattern which is both shared and do not share. And how on earth do you think the population is going to understand this? I mean, it's practically very difficult because sometimes it's shared, sometimes it's not shared. So this is an abuse of OTP that every one of us has created for ourselves. So there is no point trying to come and say that, oh, my dad is digitally illiterate, he is shared, etc., etc. What about the MP who sits in the IT committee in the parliament? I mean, he also lost money. Yeah. So digital literacy is just not a population problem, but uh, anything goes for scale building product problem. So just imagine about it. Uh, the other interesting thing that we found out when we did this uh, is RBA actually recommends suspending bank accounts based on the risk profile. So once in two years, I get this call saying from my bank guy saying that please you have to do a re-KYC, otherwise your account gets suspended. And uh, sometimes it's pretty hard for me to figure out whether it is the bank guy who's calling or is it the scammer. So you need to go physically to figure out what the heck is going on. And uh, so, so I've, I've been through this multiple re KYC thing like two or three times, and every time it's a stressful thing, even for me. So imagine an old person or even who basically chooses to give OTP because people can't live without bank accounts at least after the pre after the pandemic era. Uh, while previously it may be okay, but that is like gone. But if you go back and tell the Reserve Bank about it, the Ghana would come and tell you, but that is a bank's prerogative. We wrote a very nice circular on 2015 about FATCA. Uh, risk profile, risk analysis, but the, how the hell do you know as a consumer? No, you don't. So this still remains as a very popular version of the attack and people keep losing a lot of money about it, right? Uh, so much easier to blame others for not having digital literacy while contributing to the literacy problem by asking for phone numbers all the time. So people often come and ask me my phone numbers. I usually come and say, no, I don't give my phone numbers. And it, it surprises a lot of journalists saying that, how do I reach you? I said, why should you reach me on a phone number, right? So that's, that's the next uh, thing that you need to think about it. Uh, so what is your defense? I have about 14 phone numbers. Sometimes I forget which one I use for what. Uh, I have about 75 email IDs, probably another 20 more. So I've lost count of what I do. Uh, so that kind of is what you know prevents me from getting defrauded, but I don't think it's a scalable solution. So we, are, we, we really have to think about what we are doing with phone numbers, yeah? So the next thing is interesting. How do you bootstrap a fraud enterprise? What are the unit economics of the fraud enterprise? Uh, so this requires some VC speak, yeah? Uh, so the first thing you need to understand when you are a product development company, the VCs come and say, what's your flywheel, yeah? How do you spin the flywheel and make money? Uh, this is how the flywheel of making money works for fraud. Uh, the first is always procure IDs. The next is procure SIM cards, create bank accounts and wallets. Rehearse to scripts, profit is equal to income minus expense. I mean, so they have, uh, so not many people know that uh, fraudsters are more agile. They actually use agile the way it is supposed to be. Yeah, they have project management plans, PMPs, targets, schedules, weekly targets, monthly targets. Uh, it's a pretty sophisticated enterprise if you look at it. And in my personal opinion, they are the true agile practitioners, not the people who actually write code. Yeah, right? And uh, invest to discover more TDPs, yeah? Uh, so they are the true investors. I mean, every bit of profit is never given back to the employees as bonuses. Uh, it is always invested on creating more and more enterprise value uh, for discovering new TDPs. Then it becomes your seed capital and the circular ring runs, yeah? Uh, so just to give how they work, this is the unit economics. Uh, this is how the Jamtara scammers work so you can understand how better it is. So my goal is 100 victims per month uh, at an average income of 2 lakhs. That's really what a guy has given a goal, which is about 2,000 rupees per person per month. Yeah, And uh, so the way in which they work is uh, after every victim, 10 victims, they just knock off the SIM cards. So as soon as you get a success with one victim, you keep a counter. It's an automated thing. It is not like a pen paper thing. They truly uh, embrace a digital vision. Yeah, so. Uh, after 10 ones, it's automatically thrown out. Uh, so you could think up about 10 SIM cards you need for 100 victims. 10 per month is what you need for 100, right? And uh, they have calculated that, uh, uh, surprisingly, they have a research department. Uh, the research department basically keeps track of all government regulations, particularly around SIM cards and bank accounts. Uh, in fact, the research department is so sophisticated. 
I once uh, uh, remarked to uh, Takshashila Institute's Nitin Pai that he wrote a very think tank type of a thing which said uh, the government should use this for Coven, right? Two days later, after he published an article on Liament, I started seeing messages which says, in order to do this, uh, please uh, provide your OTP. Uh, so these guys actually keep track of think tanks much better than what uh, governments themselves do. Yeah. Uh, so between them, they figured out that uh, with one ID, you can get 18 SIM cards. And between four service providers uh, who never share data among each other, with one forged identity, you can basically get 50 SIM cards. And uh, so one ID is equal to five months of runway. And a max of two to three IDs per year is really what they are interested in harvesting. And that's a pretty manageable proposition. Yeah. Uh, so the next thing is uh, ID and fraud volume relationship. So if you look at it, it is 24 lakh income per year, three IDs. The value of one usable ID is 8 lakh rupee in a year. What do you think is the value of your ID on the data trade market? Uh, I once saw 5,000 rupee database of IDs which had about 1 million entries. <laughs> so this is basically the attacker uh, defender uh, economic conundrum. This is not a technology problem. This is basically an incentive economy of scale problem and they are far ahead than you. Yeah. Uh, so like I said, IDs can be bought, forged, obtained or even borrowed. Uh, a 10 lakh IDs estimated income is 80,000 crores which is greater than all fintech companies income put together. Yeah. And so fraud enterprises, I would probably say, are the most successful profit-making fintech innovation. You may disagree with it, but that's how it is, right? Uh, and so as losses are distributed among various banks and residents, the scale of fraud is never obvious from fragmented reports. So this is one area they are pretty good at. You see escalated fraud in every one of your company's private systems, but who's doing the aggregate view? Uh, surprisingly, no one. And they actually rebe rebel in it, right? Uh, so I'll just give three examples of this. Uh, the first is eSIM fraud. So this is my favorite. Yeah. Uh, how many of you guys uh, uh, heard about enumeration attacks? Yeah. Quite. Yeah. So this is what they did. Uh, they procure uh, for telephone numbers in market, and now they have to really figure out uh, which of those telephone numbers is linked with an ICICI bank. Uh, this is how they do it. They just keep trying those uh, numbers on the ICICA bank web portal and it comes back and says OTP sent, you know that number is linked with the ICICA bank number. Yeah. And then what they do is, uh, now they know the guy and uh, do you know how to get uh, the name of the person using their UPI ID? Have you ever heard about a feature which is, I will give you an UPI ID and I will know your name? Surprise, ICICA bank sells it using a penny drop protocol. Yeah, yeah. So officially they sell it as a service. So quite a lot of services use it for doing penny drop protocol. So you get, so think about how the scam works, right? I mean, you just basically get a whole bunch of numbers in the data trade market for 5,000 at 1 million numbers. You run through this, you get a nice subset of bank accounts linked with ICICI. You then spend one rupee on it. You get the name of the person. You call him and say that uh, the usual script, script 1, script 2, script 3, script 4. And in this particular case, what they did is uh, they had convinced them uh, that they are actually calling from Airtel. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there is a problem with their KYC and uh, please give me your uh, number to link the eSIM. So this model is what they use for taking over the SIM card by pretending to be calling from Airtel and somehow coercing them to link a third party identity, an email ID into their uh, Airtel account. And once you do that, the guy will basically take over that SIM, never visiting the store, yeah? By just doing an eSIM update and uh, importing into his iPhone. So you can imagine the steps in which they have thought through this whole thing and the gaps they have identified. Uh, so how many people, how many accounts? This is a live FAR. So this is what the police guys found out. 305 bank accounts, 2 people, 10 Airtel payment banks, 12 phone pay wallets, 10 Ola money wallets. Other than this, 91 bills of Punjab State Power Corporation Limited paid by fraudulent transactions. So you could see the entire supply chain of economy, how it works. Like money just doesn't go into just bank accounts, but it also 
uh, goes into paying bills. Yeah. So this is what I call as a bill discounting product. Uh, someone basically comes and says, "Look, I need to pay my electricity bill. I don't have money." The guy will say, "Okay, I will pay you, and I will take my 15 percent, 20 percent, right?" So this is a very well entrenched functioning alternate economy, and it's fully digital. So just be aware of what you're dealing with, right? Uh, this is another one, the fingerprint lifters, and so what they did is uh, they went to this government website which has property deeds, yeah. And if you look at the property and sale deeds, it by default they ask you to put your fingerprint on the sale deed, and uh, it also has the ID details, whatever that is. And they will take this fingerprint; it's a high-resolution image, and uh, they will. So this is the place where they get it from. So many of the state government portals actually has sale deeds of your property documents with your ID details, and uh, they would do this. Uh, thermal scanners, butter paper, thinner gel, glue, image booster chemicals. It's a perfect uh, recreation of the fingerprint and then they use it on AEPS. Uh, so quite a lot of people actually lost money on this. Yeah. So this is another example of how sophisticated they are. So do not discount them when you are creating products. Right. The last one is my favorite, uh, export licenses and arbitrage. So what they did is, um, so in case you don't understand, I'll just give a bit of context because this is the last one. Um, in order for you to do an export import in India, you need to get what is called as an IEC certificate. And uh, the IEC certificate requires you to apply an organizational DSC, where someone actually takes a video KYC, verifies your face, match, etc., etc., etc. So what these guys did is uh, they forged the documents of the directors, replaced their photographs, you see them again and again, and then actually did a video KYC, got the DSC, signed it. And then once you get in, uh, these export import licenses, then you can sell it in the market for a uh, discount or a, or a high price. So this is the level of it. How successful are they and what's the growth rate? This is the growth rate. Yeah, so you can see 2021 is like the blockbuster year they have figured out how to crack it. And this is still continuing. I mean, uh, many cases that you see here is like the tip of the iceberg kind of a thing. You can see the potential growth rates. It's about 10x. Yeah, right. And this is where the sharpshooter thing comes. Uh, yeah. So investigation. So they are making enough money here to hire a sharpshooter from Chota Shakil gang in order to give protection. Right? Uh, so this is no longer Netflix Jamtara. This is basically on the path of becoming narcos. In case you understand the implication of how they were running, right? When you're in a, when you're generating enough money that you can hire a sharpshooter for protection. Uh, you are on a very different scale of a criminal level enterprise. That's really what you are up to, right? Uh, and the last one, dead bodies. Yeah. Uh, so this entire scheme was run on a person who died of corona. So you would see the most valuable identity in the market is that of a dead body. Right? Okay. So now how do you fight this fraud at scale? Not many good answers. Okay. Okay. Now what happened to this? All right. Uh, so, what is new? Uh, like, this is now presence list, uh, pretty scalable. You don't really need to physically lift pockets from people. Uh, you can just lift it from remote. Uh, it's trivial transaction costs to run this enterprise. So, profit margins in EBITDA are around 90, 95, 98% that you wouldn't even get in the software business. Even Microsoft doesn't have those EBITDA margins. Yeah? Uh, difficulty in apprehension. So, you have anonymizing services. People are pretty pissed off. Uh, particularly cops uh, with respect to anonymizing services, it just works very well against them. Uh, public access points, uh, they have done enough uh, stuff using the public Wi-Fi. And remember, once you have SIM cards, you can do anything. Uh, sheer number of users, identity devices, low reporting, industrialization of crime. Then there is this jurisdictional arbitrage. Uh, there are some uh, stuff that I, I wish Mr. Chandra was here. It's about uh, state boundaries. State boundaries, you can't traverse states in order to investigate, and so on and so on. So, they exploit that quite bad. And uh, cross country, uh, there is thing about MLAT, right? They can't get good information because of MLAT, and so on and so on. So, every of those data sharing is actually an asset for them. So, cops usually struggle a lot. So, when you see notifications from the government to do A, B, C, D, remember this is the angle. This is not 
a different angle. You may not appreciate it. I don't like some of them, but I understand why it is at least coming, uh, particularly anonymization, because they don't know how to do it. Uh, unregistered criminal behavior is the second problem that they don't know how to do it. Yeah. The scale of operations are significantly expanded. Uh, serial crime is now replaced with parallel crime. Asymmetric advantage to the attacker. It is basically scale of economics working against them. Yeah. What is special about cyber risk? Just remember, there are adversaries on the other side. They are now operating like a cartel. Uh, best practices are shared. There are support groups. Uh, there are YouTube channels. There are Telegram channels and whatnot and whatnot. Uh, this industry actually uh, does best practice sharing better than software engineers. You should see to believe it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there is absolutely no ego. Here, there is just too much of ego. There is, there is money making as an enterprise is an absolutely egoless enterprise. They work at a much better scale than you. Yeah, increasing attack frequency, diminishing cost, pretty adaptive and dynamic. So if you look at the operational layer, uh, it changes all the time, and you can't figure it out until you go down deep uh, and and have a catalog of these things, right? Attribution challenges, low cross-border collaboration, and uh, the other problem that I mentioned is 90 percent of the total costs are attributable to indirect factors. So the true cost of cyber attacks or this kind of financial tech frauds is, is very hard to estimate and only comes over many, many years. So all you see here on the hockey stick on your individual platforms is basically the tail risk coming after years of investment by the other parties. So I don't think you can manage this on your own. Yeah. So what is needed? Uh, you need a much more strategic way of thinking about it, just not a very operational way of looking at it. Um, and that starts with understanding the scope of the problem. Do not live in denial. It's already too late. Yeah. Uh, build collective intelligence because if the other side is cartelizing and you're there on the path of doing a narcos type of a thing, there is no point trying to come and say, my company, I will not share data, et cetera, et cetera, because I don't think you can fight this. Yeah. Build collaboration platforms, innovate on standards. Uh, remember, they do much better best practice adoption than you, right? So innovate on standards, build analytics capability, and I, this I often laugh about it. Invest in law enforcement capability because they're pretty behind the curve. So it is the responsibility of researchers to go and tell them and run programs for them. Probably we have to start an institute of fraud research or something. So that's about it. I am done. Please ask your questions for the remaining time. So, uh, so we Hello. wouldn't have been able to do the study without Haryana police. And what happened was one of our co-authors is a serving police officer from the 2015 batch of the Indian Police Service. The problem was, guess the number of complaints that they receive. Can anybody guess the percentage of how many of them convert into FIRs? Because FIR is the starting point for any criminal investigation. Forget about, you know, understanding the tech and the processes, etc. Can anybody guess what, what is the percentage? And we are talking about only one state and that also half the state. Because Haryana at that time had only two cybercrime police stations, one from Northern Haryana and one for Southern Haryana. And this is based on data of uh, about nine months data from the Southern part of the Haryana police station, which is a dedicated cybercrime. So any guesses what was the actual conversion? Less than 1%, less than 1, actually it was less than 0.5% of the total number of complaints coming in. So thousands and thousands of complaints coming in, less than 0.5% they were able to convert into FIR and that was the starting point of our uh, study. And as we looked at data, then Anand cleaned up the data. We actually had police constables converting into clean re machine readable Excel sheets, which then Anand took and then he did. And I did the interviewing part where I interviewed all the cybercrime investigators because we wanted to take an ethnographic approach to the study and understand. Then we spoke to people in the MHA, we spoke to banks, we spoke to fintechs and that's how a lot of this uh, study came out. And, and uh, what Anand was trying to say, for example, somebody using KYC details of Tamil Nadu takes a SIM, is based out of Jamtara in Jharkhand and is targeting somebody in Delhi or NCR region. So there are three or four jurisdictions 
and the police are going nuts trying to i mean besides the other challenges they have trying to figure out how to investigate that case because so many jurisdictions are involved and the worst part is because of technology and the fintechs are always how much of security how much of ease of use and that leads to a lot of gaps in in the that's what our study revealed so over to you for questions yeah hello hello so uh, you talked about the kind of frauds that are happening in fintech i'm sorry yeah right and you said that okay uh, they, they are not very high skilled as of now they are doing like uh, they'll call you ask for the otp they send you an sms but uh, what i have seen personally i have analyzed multiple cases where we see this trend that they are actually uh, have started uh, getting highly technical we have analyzed multiple campaigns targeting the customers of prominent indian banks uh, where they were actually pushing out android malware and the malware was good it had the capability to put your phone on silent it had the capability to uh, put your black in your screen and it had the capability to uh, steal your otps and they were using the fear greed tactic to get you to install the apk now once you install the apk you have already given them the uh, your credentials because you wanted the reward yeah. point the after the apk gets installed now the kind of data that the threat actors have these hackers have uh, it gives them the capability to automate all their attacks so the way the malware works is uh, the threat actor will initiate the transaction using your credentials the malware will put your phone on silent at the same time it will blacken the screen you will receive the otp transaction message the malware will steal the otp send it to the command and control server and delete the all the transaction related messages and you will be ne never be able to even know until unless you go and get a mini yeah. statement or something so what i'm actually asking is is the law enforcement even capable of investigating these kind of cases as of now because the answer is no yeah because and uh, remember uh, as a sample set remember the study is based on 2020 2021 for a very small thing and this was basically the beginning of that uh, fraud cycle yeah and after that, the tdps have become pretty sophisticated uh, many times cops are completely and totally clueless about what the heck just happened right and uh, uh, they don't have forensic capabilities they don't understand how to do it banks are not interested uh, so if you look at the uh, the fraud diagram i gave you right uh, so mere along that one second this one uh 2021 onwards they started putting more and more money on more tdps so it's become rapidly industrialized it's no longer your normal jamtara scanners uh, the value chain in terms of attacks and sophistication has dramatically increased but we couldn't see it on the fars but we could see the general trend uh, by analyzing the complaints and remember the other data that we got right uh, if you had gotten 100 complaints uh 200 complaints only one of them went to the fir so this is basically an fir data there is only so much a cop can do and uh, there isn't much we can do to go figure out beyond a point so they could analyze what they could they picked up what they could and uh, the other interesting thing uh, i was told is that uh, the customer may have lost the money but the bank may have refunded back the money in which case uh, it wouldn't come back to them as an fir Uh, so uh, they wouldn't they would lose money but they would get back and the tdps are unknown no one cares and it just go to the next person and next person and so on so i am not at all surprised like i said this industry is when you are hiring sharp shooters for protection you are already on the narcos path yeah you are no longer on the jam tara path of netflix kind of you are already on the narcos path this is now professional industry which can hire killers Yeah. so just be aware But of it the only difference here uh, with this industry and narcos is that narcos is still not on technology uh while they are using technology narcos you will have to go on the streets to sell your drugs but if you put your products on amazon.com the world becomes your customer or the victim just an intervention did you read the latest kin article where a fintech founder said we feel like running a drug industry <laughs> please read the ken article uh, it basically talked about a fintech founder it was there in the public twitter feed uh, the guy says that it looks like we are running a drug industry so he's not very far off yeah? yeah and and the problem here is that no one actually knows so i can analyze that right but i'm not law enforcement i can't take action 
uh, if I report it to law enforcement, they don't know what action to take. Yeah. I'll give you uh, one simple thing and you all can try this. Go on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, whatever. Pick out your five favorite uh, B2C companies. It can be PhonePay, it can be Google Pay, it can be Zomato or any other company like that that you use in your day-to-day -day life. And search the name of the company with the keywords customer care number. And you will see hundreds of fake customer care numbers posted on Twitter. No one knows what to do with those fake customer care numbers and they are present on the, all those. You can, like, it is also present on YouTube, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically they are poisoning the search results. A person searches for a, I mean, my father who is not technically adept, he'll search for a yeah. uh, customer the, care The SEO game is better than uh, anyone else I've ever seen. So yeah. sophisticated marketing is part of their uh, exactly. investment budget. Uh, Anand uh, here, uh, how much uh, do you think uh, telcos contribute to uh, this problem? I used to head uh, Infosec for a, a fast growing uh, fintech and uh, there have been a lot of uh, cases. Most of it uh, can be attributed to the synthetic IDs uh, through the uh, mobile numbers. Cops have always told me KYC is broken. And it is broken so badly that uh, they don't want to speculate about it. I mean... The? It's quite possible. I mean, I don't know enough to speculate it, but at least the cops have told him when he interviewed it. So, in, in one case we found, talking about KYC, somebody used the bank's address as his address and it was mandated, it was cleared as legitimate KYC and the case was done. So, we found hundreds and hundreds of cases like that where all kinds of addresses, somewhere a temple, somewhere this, and all were cleared as legitimate KYCs. The, there was one more interesting case, no? That, uh, the there was one more interesting case. Uh, I wish Mr. Chandra was here. He would be very specific about details. Uh, many of the banks had signed with one OTP provider. Yes. So oh, that was that was hilarious. Many of the yeah, so so uh, based on some tip off, Gurgaon police intercepted a car. And they found a group of people with hundreds of SIM cards and hundreds of phones, etc. And they were like, what is this guy doing and so many laptops, etc. When they started investigating the case, turned out that this was a gang working out of Delhi, targeting fintech customers. And one of them worked in a company that used to generate OTP. And they used, to, they used to have a revenue of hundreds of crores. And it had a very small number of people. So what this guy was doing was they had been... Uh, contracted by one of the major banks to generate OTPs. As soon as the OTP would generate, this man, because he had access to all this data, would inform the other scamsters in his group and then they would start using, citing that OTP, call up the target customer, start uh, asking them to, uh, you know, uh, install either a team viewer or something on the mobile phone and then start uh, sucking out all the money from their account. So this, I mean, all sorts of sophistication was being done, both in terms of process and in terms of technology. They, they even had Ethernet cables running into yeah. that company. <laughs> so imagine running a fiber optic line into a company to, to steal OTPs. I mean, this is really what you're looking at, not, not some guy who calls and says, please free. That is like the operational part. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for the great talk before. So, uh, my question was that uh, recently we have seen a lot of banks issuing a lot of SMSs warning people from not sending their OTPs to a lot of people. So, the first part of my question is, would that actually work? Uh, and secondly, has it actually reduced any, uh, any kind not of... Not at all. In fact, what the biggest problem that the police was facing was that nobody, and especially if it's an OTP which is generated as an SMS, that is a major point of failure. In fact, they were saying if the OTP could come on a voice call, that would have lesser because once the OTP comes on the screen, people just see the first part. There is a message which also comes with it. Please don't share it. Nobody sees it. And moment they see the OTP and somebody says, have you received an OTP? That itself is a major point of failure. There was another interesting thing. Again, we don't want to name banks. But this bank allows your registered mobile number to be used for uh, logging into your account. So these people bought hundreds and hundreds of phone numbers from various illegal vendors and they would keep entering the number on the bank's website 
if the number is not registered it would keep rejecting it moment it would say that it recognized a registered number it would say do you want to use forget password so that became an indication ki this number is registered to that immediately they would do a profile check call up that customer and say i'm calling from this particular bank we will be sending you this you have to do this etc and suddenly the person has lost all their money so pretty innovative in stitching services yeah so um, buy from one buy from one buy from one pretty good assemblers pretty good assemblers and, and it's not just a fintech issue it's a fintech issue it's a, a law enforcement issue it's a telecom issue so they have figured out many ways of how to exploit various processes or the tech or the processes in all these players and and npci which has some idea of how the money is, is getting inundated with more and more crpc 91 requests because and they're trying to keep, catch up because moment one money is taken into one wallet it is quickly passed through six or seven different other wallets at times even turned into gift certificates and then in cash right away and all this is happening within a matter of minutes by the time the police get and they reach the first point of where the money was transferred already weeks if not months have already yeah. passed through before 24 hours your money is split merged gone gone uh, and uh, no one can keep up with it uh, and as a result the digital payments ecosystem they are now struggling because every time a customer is defrauded even the amounts may be low 30000 40000 but just one day we saw collectively the payments come up to collectively the defraud is something in the region of 2 crores 3 crores in a day so you spread that out from across agencies countries etc it's a massive amount but nobody is because initially the complaint looks very small nobody is able to suss out what is the actual scale of this uh, problem and and they are losing customers because once a person loses 40000 from one digital payments wallet why would they want to etc they would start going back to traditional methods a uh, very interesting presentation thank you um i foster i mean foster sir sorry so i i'm kind of trying to think from a defender perspective um so my my question is a two part question one uh, the core layer that you were talking about right telecoms and the banks right um so those are the only two places where you know everyone can attack okay and Welcome. the second thing and the second thing is the attackers have some piece of information that belongs to you your phone number your pan card your aadhar number or whatever um separately uh, government of india has also been building up a database where your aadhar is getting linked to your pan number your you know phone number and all of it um can there be some kind of a centralized authentication mechanism or authorization mechanism where any request so for example if a fraudster takes your mobile number and says i want a replacement sim um uh, where you actually get an authorization from a centralized authority that will probably be solving the problem of data sharing as well um so i'm just wondering if if building a centralized uh, you know authentication authority which does that verification based on risk profiling or something human identity is a hard problem <laughs> no i'm i'm just wondering i mean i i'm sure it's pretty i'm, I'm just trying to tell you again and again human identity is a hard problem okay i mean if it were this simple we built it sir i have question <laughs> so uh, you know like we are saying uh, it's very hard to trace these scammers uh, i see you know cyber crime departments still they are using very secure os windows 7 <laughs> so uh, you know like uh, actually india i feel india became one of the most world's uh, best payment gateway solution you know like from the pani puri sellers to unicorn companies they are using UPI payment gateways and uh, this digital india is getting very quickly getting scaled and you know uh, uh, getting uh, you know developed do you think uh, the uh, non technical people are ready for this digital india you know only they are becoming the main targets for such scam attacks they cannot target security researchers and you know such it people so uh, do you think the security researchers are ready for this you know like i'll almost like even like you know when it comes to social engineering everyone is getting yeah, hacked even the technical guys are not ready for it i mean yeah. uh, so you are basically looking at a cambrian explosion uh, of yeah, digitalization it's like, yeah it's not just about the profession uh, you know 
it's all about the like the general uh, set of people of india or do you think government has something to do uh, you know spreading awareness on this yeah so uh, one is that you know there there needs to be a lot more communication and that there is a gap in communication plus people while they adapt to technology very fast they don't understand the risks behind behind their technology also uh, part of this structure also needs deterrence deterrence comes from good investigation which will also lead to but there are so many gaps in our laws today like one major problem that we saw is the it act mandates that every cyber crime investigation under section 66 or other sections of the it act immediately automatically must get have an inspector or above level officer to do the investigation now the problem is states are hard pressed to have investigators and uh, at the inspector and above level because their numbers get lesser and lesser and an inspector is a fairly senior rank because he has he or she has to manage the police station etc and hundreds of administrative duties where do they have the time plus there is no dedicated cyber crime uh, training given to any of them so they'll spend their life doing normal crime and suddenly get thrust into the cyber crime and the other problem is that the people who are now doing the actual investigations they are much lower in the hierarchy but they are larger in number and in some cases they don't even have laptops forget about having the ability to do digital forensics etc yeah, so because there is no deterrence more scamsters feel very happy to go ahead and continue with yeah, but like yeah, yeah the government can do a lot sorry but, uh, are they i don't know <laughs> but yeah but still no harm to the ps like you know not everything can be converted to fair they have important cases to deal with yeah. 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 Um, I know this form of argument towards India, but it's a very different country that has solved this problem that you could learn from. Hello. Yeah. Sorry. So to repeat the question, like I know this was targeted towards India as a talk, but are there other countries with similar systems that have solved the problem or remediated it? When you say other countries with similar problems. tell me which other country has 1.3 billion people <laughs> tell me which other country has the complexity that india has so it's very easy to say that other countries may have solved etc but nobody understands the scale and the complexity of our systems so we'll have to create some we can learn from the others but some lessons etc will also have to work within the context that we operate in and the challenges the unique challenges that india has before we will be able to solve some of these issues I mean, india's problems are india's solutions that is the way yeah. in which you put it <laughs> there's there's no uh, other way to do it actually. i mean we okay. figure out the upi part because ourselves you may, we have to figure out the fraud part ourselves i don't think we can look out we can we can do some best practice kind of figuring it out uh, but the structural problems here are kind of unique so it is really up to us to figure out that part no point I mean, trying to go beyond i, I know problems. i know of companies which come and try to offer solutions but moment they see the scale at which our government etc has to work it's unmatched i mean it's very easy to blame the government easy very easy to blame authorities but we have seen from the inside the amount of uh, scale of challenges that they face and it some of it is pretty heroic i mean our respect for law enforcement went up tremendously yeah, with the kind I, of stuff they pull off despite these challenges yeah, actually as a as a private researcher i'd always uh, psycho knows it very well and I, i i was not a very fond person of law enforcement uh, until i actually started getting involved with them on a day to day basis it's it's quite mind blowing given the kind of resources and the problems they have they're even able to do whatever they can now is it sufficient as citizens no uh, so the job is for us to basically go figure out how to work around this problem because like i keep saying it's not hit narco scale what i know waiting for uh the next is the guy sorry to interrupt Al yeah sorry. sorry to interrupt but if anyone have a question you can come here and personally meet to anand sir because we are running late just one last question i have uh, yeah sure uh so this is one part of scam that is going on and we are aware of it parallelly there is another set of scam that is being run by another associated it is usually associated with another uh, country that they are running a set of loan applications they will give you a small certain set of loan with some certain documents you have to install the applications and the moment you do that you are into the trap is government looking into it 
there's something being done on that part uh, you were mentioning the chinese loan scams yeah yeah i mean uh, so i had worked on that uh, it's it's a pretty sophisticated operation no doubt and lot of the actions today you're seeing on digital lending guidelines came from that uh, it is it is a problem that they are trying to do whatever they can uh, that is the way in which i would see it it is slightly better than what it is in fact quite better than what it was at the peak of the 2021 uh, but lot more can be done there's no doubt that lot more can be done like some measures like at the central government level if you see under the ministry of home affairs they've created what is called the i4c so they are trying to attack one part of the problem under certain you have the cyber swatch kendra they are trying to attack another part of the problem then at state levels now because they understand the jurisdictional issues many state police forces have created they always had cyber crime police stations and cyber crime units but now they have created specific like jharkhand has done this a dedicated dig level officer to coordinate with other state police forces who are coming to their state to handle or investigate such kind of crimes so at different different levels different different things are happening and we are also working on a solution because now that we have understood a large part of this problem we are working on a solution that will hopefully maybe at the next nalcon talk we will be able to talk about it but the idea is that if you are able to understand what the problem is from their perspective which is you know people who are dealing with it on a day to day basis then you suddenly realize what is the complexity they are facing and then try and add our capacities that is our combined capacities to their efforts so that we can resolve this issue to our yeah knowledge. but in this specific use case it is not the exploitation of human vulnerability because the person knows that he is going to you know engage with a nbfc kind of firm to borrow a small amount of loan and he knows that he is sharing otp to get the or, or whatever you know to get the money in his account so there is no human training involved here because you cannot train someone to not take the loan right and these people who are running this scam they are running multiple set of the same set of code is being manip- uh, like morphed in a different format and they are launched as uh, applications you can install it and then they'll uh, ask for all the permissions basically yeah. your contact details uh, files media multimedia so, so since we are running out of time what i would suggest okay. is the 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 report is on the website and as i said this is just a work in progress because okay. this was done in a particular period so you can go to our website deepstrat.in and you can study this and maybe we can carry forward this conversation sure at a, at a later date yeah i mean i can comment on this sure yeah. but thank you very much for having us and great to be back at nalco thank you.